Do you remember the first time that you tasted snow? Do you remember the first time that you tasted 200-year-old snow? Well, I do. I licked it right off the wall of a cave made of ice, sitting underneath a glacier just north of Juneau, Alaska. And I've got to tell you, this was the purest, crispest, coldest H2O I have ever tasted. Of course, it wasn't snow anymore by the time that I tasted it. It was this gorgeous blue glacial ice. Really, if you ever have the chance to lick a glacier, you really got to do it. <laughs> glacier ice is this color blue that almost defies description because it only occurs in these places and you can really only compare it to itself. So around 200 years ago, much higher up that mountain valley, this ice fell as snow. And the atmosphere through which those snowflakes fell was very different from our own. It contained a full one-third less carbon dioxide than our atmosphere does. Now, those snowflakes were buried by flurry after flurry until Eventually, every last bubble of air was squeezed out from between those delicate little crystals, and it formed a solid mass. Yet somehow, that solid mass was still able to flow, and was buried and then carried along this journey by gravity and time in a frozen time capsule called Mendenhall Glacier. Until one day, that ice, that mountain of old snow, it, it crossed this little bump in the terrain, and it created a void, a cave. And that's where it met me. And if I had known the incredible journey that this, uh, this H2O had been on, I might not have drank it and turned it into pee, but here we are. I was only able to see this because I was there at the right place in the right moment in time. And I'm sharing it with you today because it no longer exists. You know, the same slow creep of gravity and time that, that brought all of that ice from the mountain down to my mouth, it does ensure that any ice cave has a short lifespan. But as they disappear, these ice caves are usually replaced by others, as the mass of that glacier sort of flows in behind it. It's this really beautiful cycle of death and rebirth of these temporary places. At least that's how the story has gone for thousands of years. That story is now different. Because this glacier is dying. It is melting faster than time and snow can replace it. I want you to look at this color blue. How does it make you feel? I'm showing it to you. I'm asking you to look at this color of this ice from this cave that no longer exists to burn one idea into your mind. The wonders that we never see, we will never miss. Now, when I visited this cave, I, I didn't know that I'd be giving its eulogy one day. Uh, I went there to make a video for my YouTube channel. My channel is called It's OK to Be Smart. And I make educational videos that are viewed by millions of people around the world who join me on these little curiosity journeys as, as I tell really bad dad jokes. And I'm a dad now, so I'm allowed to. <laughs> Stuff like, you should never fight an octopus. They're well armed. <laughs> I'm not sorry. <laughs> it's okay to be smart is also a motto that reminds people that Discovering the answers to things, it feels good. It's a feeling that the physicist Richard Feynman once called the pleasure of finding things out. Unless you're finding out that beautiful glacial ice caves are dying, I guess that doesn't feel so good. But that's not what the video was about. The video was about physics. It was about why glacial ice is this beautiful color blue. And the answer is really, really cool. And you need to know it because there are wrong answers all over the internet 
And next to climate change, I don't think there's anything that makes me more sad than that. Now, it's not because of the same reason that the sky is blue. It's not because of light bouncing off of little particles. It's not reflecting the color of the sky or anything like that. No, it's way, way cooler than that. So inside of that glacier are a bunch of water molecules, like thousands at least. And they're in there. And even though it's a solid mass, they're vibrating. Molecules just vibrate. It's what they do. They're like amped up TED speakers or chihuahuas or something. So water is this V-shaped molecule. You've got an oxygen right here, and then you've got two hydrogens up here, okay? Now, some of those water molecules are in there, and they're vibrating like this, and some are vibrating like this. This is the glacier vibrating water dance that you guys can do at your next party. Okay, so light vibrates too, because it acts like a wave. So if light comes along at the right color, at the right frequency or wavelength, Turns out, it can be vibrating in sync with that water molecule, and that water molecule sucks it right up. And that color of light is subtracted out. Okay, so it turns out that one of water's favorite wavelengths to suck up when it's doing its little vibration dance is around 700 nanometers. That is reddish-orange light. And if you take the white light of the sun, all the colors, subtract out red-orange, you're left with that beautiful blue color. And every designer in the audience is like, that's more of a cyan, but you know, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> you can only see this when you're deep inside of a glacier, as the light is passed through several meters of all these vibrating water molecules. And this is the same reason that the ocean is blue. Now, who loves this color just like a little bit more now? Yeah, that's what I thought. <laughs> and creating that feeling, people, is what motivates me to educate the world through YouTube videos. Because sharing stories like this, helping people know this, understand this, you know, it feels good. It brings us joy, right? But it can also bring us sadness when we learn that the thing that we just learned to love is never going to exist on that spot ever again, ever again in our lifetime. That doesn't feel very good. But I do it so that we see it and we know it and that we learn to love it. Because maybe then we'll fight just a little bit harder to save it. So thanks to human activities from climate change, environmental pollution, to habitat loss. More of the natural world, living and non-living alike, is under threat today than at any point in our human existence. The entire time our species has been around. We're talking more birds, more ice, more forests, more islands, insects, mammals, just about everything. But for every rhino or orangutan or coral reef or ancient tree or Whatever famous and endangered thing that we've all heard of, there are tens, maybe hundreds, that we never hear about. Those weird deep sea fish, these forest sized webs of fungus, these ice caves, or the Indian purple frog. <laughs> whatever that's supposed to be. <laughs> They're disappearing, but invisible and unknown. But it doesn't have to be this way. So most of you raise your hands that you feel like you love this color blue a little bit more. How did I make you feel that way? Why did I make you feel that way? Well. I was in the right place at the right time, I guess, but to be honest, I saw 12 other people in that cave that day, and um, I don't see any of them up here today helping you build a deep emotional bond with a color, so. And I'm not, I'm not lucky. I wasn't elected in a lottery to be the dying glacier ambassador. And I am just one person. We don't live in a Disney film. 
And no matter how much I love that glacier, I'm not enough to save it on my own. Maybe if I was Elsa, though. <laughs> what made the difference is that I shared its story. And not just its story, but the sense of wonder that it brought me. I believe this. If every one of Earth's nearly 8 billion people truly knew the scale, the stories that we stand to lose, we would never let it happen. And luckily, all of you have the tools to help them see. You all have a voice. You're all probably carrying a camera in your pocket. You have a sense of curiosity, a drive to know more. And the most important thing you have, that we all have, is that little voice in the back of your mind that when you see something really amazing, says, man, isn't that wonderful? You know, our species is, is everywhere on this planet, which is part of the problem. But just imagine how many places, how many creatures, how many stories one person is in the right place at the right moment to see. And today, what one person sees, we can all see. What one person loves, we can all learn to love. That is why I make YouTube videos. Because when we all see, we all know, and we all learn to love what we stand to lose, then we will fight harder to save it. There's one book that I return to every year to reread. It's called A Sand County Almanac by Aldo Leopold. He was a conservationist way back in the 20th century whose work in conservation helped us develop a completely new philosophy of how humans and the wild world interact. This book is a collection of stories about nature as he saw it. And he has this ability to make the most mundane things look like they were painted into the landscape by like Michelangelo himself. I mean, he can turn a single shrub into the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel. It's truly amazing. There's one passage that stands out. He's camping near the banks of a wild river in Wisconsin. And there are no wild rivers in Wisconsin anymore. And up around the bend come two young men in a canoe. They pull up to the shore and they get to talking and he learns that these two young men are about to ship out for the army. They're city boys. This is their first and likely their very last trip to the wilderness. And they have fallen in love with this place. It's given them something to remember, something that they'll miss wherever it is that they're going. And as he tells their story, he also tells the story of this place, of the river, the fish, the trees, the forest, and how it's being dammed up and cut down in the name of progress nearly a hundred years ago. And as those two young men set their canoe on down the river, he ends the story with this thought. Perhaps our grandsons, having never seen a wild river, will never miss the chance to set a canoe and singing waters. The wonders that we never see, we will never miss. Because he was there at that moment. He helped me see, and I really wish I could have saved that place. What if we all turned our tools towards nature just a little bit more often? What could we save? So, if you see a wild river or an ice cave or, I don't know, that tree that you walk by every single day, or a weird purple frog, then learn its story, why it is the way that it is, 
and then share it with the rest of us so that we don't miss our chance to see it. Thank you.